moving around. Sweet. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. How's everyone doing? Looking good. A couple smiles. All right, that's good to, good to see. Uh, so welcome to the talk on refactoring. Um, the name has actually changed what's benefits and tips. I decided kind of last minute that I was going to change it into a story that's about my first job. Uh, but a little bit about me. So I, my background's in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, I got hired out of school to work for Siemens, which is the third largest company in the world. So I have lots of experience on like the big corporate side. Uh, and with that, I was more on like the business front. So doing a lot of project management, uh, sales and marketing, account management. Uh, but that really wasn't for me. So about two and a half years ago, I decided to quit my job and pursue web development. Um, and since then, I've had a lot of different contract gigs. I was also an instructor at General Assembly. So I think this puts me in a pretty unique position because I've seen a lot of brownfield code bases. And I also haven't been doing this uh, super incredibly long. So to me, uh, you know, I'm, I can relate to the new developer who's just coming up and just trying to understand what's going on in a project. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story that's based on real events. Um, actually, for then, uh, so right now, what I do is I'm a front-end developer with Florence Healthcare. So we're like a HIPAA-compliant Dropbox. We have a bunch of workflows for document uh, management and clinical trials. And then in my free time, I am the CTO for a nonprofit, uh, and we raffle off like luxury uh, electronic items, and we donate all the profits to charity. So when I started my first job, um, this was about two years ago, uh, my, the first task that they gave me, the real reason why I was hired, is to come in and take this, uh, like the free tools that they offered and come in and refactor the tools. And at the time, you know, I'd done a bunch of tutorials and they kind of talked about refactoring, but I didn't really know what this term refactoring meant. So first thing I did was what any self-respecting developer does. I nodded my head like I knew what I was talking about and then Googled it in private. And what I learned is refactoring comes down to two different concepts, uh, combined concepts rather. And the first one is that the behavior stays the same. So you're not altering the output. So you can see in the diagram on the right, uh, we're still trying to get from A to B it's just a matter of how we get from A to B. And you can see that six is a lot cleaner. You could say the quality is a lot higher. Um, but when I started, you know, I saw this, this word, this phrase being thrown around of code quality. And I could easily see, you know, in this diagram number six, that that was a lot cleaner to understand, but I didn't really get how, how this translates. What does number six look like in terms of real code? So I went back to Google and Googled code quality. And I found this diagram, and I swear this to this day is the most descriptive uh, drawing of what code quality means. It's the minimum amount of WTFs per minute. So I want to take a quick poll. Uh, how many people have said WTF when looking at a code base before? All right. Uh, how many people? have said WTF about their own code base before. All right, humble crowd, love it, love it. So I knew I couldn't go back to my boss and be like, yeah, I figured out what code quality means. It means minimum WTFs per minute. Probably, you know, get shunned from the group for the rest of my contract. So instead, I found another awesome definition, and it's a loose approximation for long-term usefulness and maintainability. Uh, so flash forward to now um, with my uh, with having a lot more experience, I've kind of come up with my own definition of what code quality means. And it's uh, three things that overlap and then come together. Uh, first is the readability. So how, how, when you actually look at a single line of code, can you actually understand what's going on? Maybe a couple of lines of code. And now understandability, which is kind of similar, is when you can actually follow along. So when you have a train of thought, you actually understand, you know, what this person is trying to do in this model. Um, you know, what is the objective of this method? Things like that. 
And thirdly, these two really build up into maintainability. So that's you know how easy it is to fix a bug or to maybe add a little bit of a new feature. And when you put these three together, what you get is flexibility. In a pragmatic sense, flexibility means that when your CEO or your boss says, hey, I know it used to do feature A, but now we need it to do feature B. Low quality, low quality code, your response will probably be like, it was not made to do that, so that's going to be a challenge. That's a sign of low quality code. And a sign of high quality code is when you're like, okay, I can do that. That's not going to take long. So I think we've all worked on projects on both ends of that spectrum. So at this point, you know, I knew what refactoring was. I kind of had an idea of what code quality was. Um, but I didn't really understand why a company would be okay with you spending time to do something that doesn't change the output. This is something really unique to software. Uh, you know, I, I have a mechanical engineering background. And if you just tell your boss, like, hey, I'm going to move this diagram around, they'd be like, what are you talking about? But you, I'm not going to pay you to move a diagram around. So my next thing was to research, why do people refactor? And it's because the time that it takes to refactor is significantly dwarfed by the time that it takes to read, understand, and maintain code. And it's important to acknowledge that there is a time here. So there is an investment cost. Uh, a lot of managers uh, really just see this cost. Um, and sometimes it's not worth it. It's really not. Because let's say you know, it's Friday, and your customer or you know, whoever your client says, like, hey, if you don't have this done by Friday, I'm not going to pay, pay full price or pay your salary or whatever reason. So sometimes it's not worth it. In that case, you shouldn't be worrying about refactoring. You need to get that code out. But overall, you better hope that you can pay for it because the benefits outweigh the cost. And just refusing will lead to technical debt. But a lot of people are familiar with this term. It's just you know when you just have this section of code that you're just like, I don't want to touch that. That looks bad. Uh, I'm guilty of that. My current company, I have like three files that I don't really want to touch ever. Uh, and what, what this can lead to on a team is code entropy. So when you bring on another developer, if they're a junior, they're probably they're going to try and emulate you. But they're not going to be as good as you, so they're going to do 80% as well as you. You can think about this as the interest on the technical debt. So if your code is not exemplary, you know, they're going to do less than whatever you're at. And over time, once you start to accrue this technical debt, you know, all these people are working on this code base, and you just have a really high level of entropy, um, people will start to feel overwhelmed. Uh, I personally have felt overwhelmed in the last couple of months working on another uh, developer's code base. And uh, what I would consider the dark side in here is when you totally scrap the project. So uh, I think you know, everyone here has seen a code base and been like, I, I'm not even going to deal with this. I'm just going to totally start with a brand new file. So um, let's see. All right. So what we're going to do now. So when I started this job, you know, and I had done this research, now I know what refactoring is. I know why people do it, you know, what the end goal is. And I looked at the starting code, and I was immediately overwhelmed. I actually asked my coworkers if it was OK, if I could just totally scrap it and start over. And they said, and they were right, that it would be a great learning experience if I actually did it. And um, sorry, didn't start over, but actually refactored it myself. So the first thing I did was just try to like read through it, just attempt to understand it. And you can imagine that if these comments weren't here, It'd be really hard to follow along with what this code sample is doing. Uh, you know, I'm like creating random objects. Uh, I'm doing something across whatever F's is. Uh, what's up? Oh, okay. Real large. We good? All right. Sweet. 
So, uh, you know, just trying to follow along with it, I was really struggling. Didn't really know what SO was, CO, um, you know, what, what, how I could group these things together. I really just had to keep a lot in my internal memory. So my understandability was really low. Uh, I'd probably get like three or four lines and be like, what, wait, what is this? So uh, I realized that I needed to be thinking concretely of how I could clean this code. And the most concrete thing that I could think of is what I call alphabet soup. So in this example, we have stuff like SO, uh, we have F here, Fs, who even knows what this is. So just by writing it out, so taking this SO and putting significant other. Uh, for, like I remember when I first started learning JavaScript, totally hated it. Something really popular in the JavaScript community, I guess because there's extra syntax, is just to like minify stuff, even though we have minifiers. So uh, just by adding this, you can drastically increase the readability uh, and improve the quality of the code. So just by doing that, um, it's really popular in the Ruby community to, whenever you have a block, to make it a one letter. Um, I think that's a little silly. Adding a couple letters drastically increases the readability of your code. And there's only one exception to this, and that is when it's like globally known that every developer knows what you're talking about by this letter. So the common examples are I for index. Uh, when you're doing Rails forms, the F in the form, it's kind of redundant just to write form a bunch of times. Uh, and also, if you're doing jQuery or different JavaScript events, you can write E. Like people, people will know what that means. So at this point, I had written out you know, what all these things meant. A new CEO meant coming over, so I didn't really need these comments because the code was starting to document itself. So the next thing that I noticed, and this is really prominent in JavaScript, especially uh, with like carousels and timeouts, I guarantee you that if you have a timeout in your code, you're probably going to uh, have what I call a magic number. So if you don't know much about physics, you probably have no idea what this number is. And I would guarantee that you have no idea what this number is. So having just assigning variables to these numbers is a quick and easy win so that you don't have magic numbers anymore. So Earth's gravity and then my height, just applying this now if you know a little bit of physics or you really don't need to know the details anymore. So you don't have to think about this. And that's the key point that I'm trying to drive at. You don't have to think anymore about what these different single line attributes are. So, so far, these two topics have been increasing readability, um, but it was still a challenge to follow along here and get the understandability. So I could read each line and I was understanding exactly what uh, was going on, but Around the like 10 line mark, I wasn't able to keep my train of thought going. So uh, what my mentor suggested is that I just break things up into methods. And so that's what I did. Now this will add a bunch of lines to your code, but uh, it can drastically increase the readability or the understandability rather, because you're abstracting away what you're doing from how you're doing it. So if I don't look at any of these methods and what's going on up there, this code has become much simpler. So now I can look at this code and I can understand what it's doing. So I was really pumped because now, you know, just having an idea of what's going on. So with this, um, another thing that you can do to clean up is to apply the single purpose principle. So my mentor pointed out that my methods were doing way too much. And the easiest way to tell if it's doing way too much is to describe what this method does in one sentence. And if you use the word and, then it's doing too much. So in here, actually, in this example, I have the word and uh, in here as well. So this was a sign that I was doing too much. Uh, and Sandy Metz, um, one of her books, actually one of her blog article, she talks about another way that you can tell it's doing too much is if the method is over five lines long. 
And I, I think that's mostly applicable to Ruby because JavaScript, you have a bunch of extra syntax that you need to apply. But uh, in JavaScript, I would say if it's more than 10 lines, you're probably doing too much in the single method. So after this, I was able to break things up and simplify and had a lot of, um, everything was doing one objective. So the next thing, if you notice these, uh, these, all these methods, and really down here it's pretty clear, is that none of this stuff was abstracted out into different objects. Like I was doing, you know, who is supposed to be inviting the friends over? Is that one of my friends is supposed to invite their friends? You know, who is supposed to be doing this? Um, and then that's when I decided to break things out into classes. So, I mean, it seems kind of intuitive now if you have some experience, but um, in general, this is a really awesome process to abstract it away as much as possible so you don't have to be thinking about it and to increase the understandability of the code. So, uh, before I had these lines where I was just randomly creating these hashes, Instead, I created a class of friend. And this way, I could group the state with the behavior of these objects. And it made it a lot simpler. So now, I have all the code broken up into classes. But um, one thing that kind of bothered me and didn't allow me to maintain the code very well is an example right here, really easy win, is that um, Right, right in this example, I have to memorize what each of these arguments are. So I have to memorize that the third argument is the significant other. I have to memorize that the fourth argument is if they're busy or not. And that doesn't really, you know, like if I want to switch those around, or maybe I define if someone's busy before I define their phone number, uh, you know, the, the order of those is just out of place. So what I did instead, was I minimize the amount of params. So in JavaScript, uh, you can do this with an object, but keep in mind there might be side effects if you alter it because of how JavaScript remembers things by reference. Uh, but in Ruby, you can just pass in a hash or you can pass in an object, so it becomes much simpler. And the maintainability goes up. So now, if I pass in too much stuff, it's not a problem at all, but if you just have this strategy up here, you know, usually the rule of thumb is two, is when once you have more than two, you should look into passing in a hash or an object. Uh, then, uh, sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah, it drastically increases the maintainability, the order doesn't matter. So, you know, if I change this to up here and save that, my code's gonna run just fine. So at this point, you know, I'm passing in uh, hashes, things are becoming much cleaner, I can pass in too much stuff, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but, and I've organized all my stuff into classes, and then I was like, I'm gonna be a good developer, do what I'm supposed to do, I'm gonna start testing all this stuff. So I'm testing each one of these methods, still testing, still testing, at this point, I'm like, I hate my life. I'm still writing tests, days and days of tests. And that's, you know, I started complaining. I'm like, I can't believe I'm sitting around for days just writing tests. Uh, and then that's when my coworker was like, why, why are you writing tests for all this stuff? What you should be doing is just limiting the API. So by limiting the API, you know, you're actually telling future developers, hey, this is the stuff that you should care about. You know, I think a real world example is like, hey, Mark, I want you to go get me chicken tenders at Chick-fil-A. I don't really care that he has to go to his car, how much it's going to cost, how he's going to get there, which Chick-fil-A, you know, what he's going to order. I don't really care about that. All I care about is when he comes back, he should have chicken tenders. So, excuse me, chicken strips, probably CFA fanatics. So, uh, at this point, I decided to limit the API into what I actually cared about. So, um, you know, in this case, this was only used inside, so I didn't really care about that. And then you only really have to test the public methods, which is, you know, saves a ton of time. So at this point, 
I have all of the methods broken up into classes. I'm able to abstract that out. I have good tests. And, uh, but I have a lot of just regular comments that aren't adding any value. So all these comments are explaining what the code is doing, and that's kind of overkill. So what comments should be used for is explaining why. When you want to explain what code is doing, that's when you should be thinking about naming your variables and your methods better. And the only kind of exception is when you want to explain how. Usually with how, that means you need to break up things into more methods. But if it's really complex, if you're doing some really complex algorithm, then that's the scenario. That's like the one exception where it's OK to use a comment for how. And so now, with this, I had code abstracted out. It was very easy to read and follow along, um, not very complex. Uh, most of all, it was really maintainable. So if my wife said, hey, when you have to clean the apartment, you can't just do the dishes and you know, clean the floors. You also have to take the trash out. Before, with the original code, I would have really no idea where to start um, you know, in a not contrived example. Uh, but with here, it's very obvious, oh, that's a part of cleaning the apartment. I know exactly where to go. And then the next developer doesn't have to worry about the details of that. So that said, all right. So here are the strategies that we covered and the ones that I think are really useful. And they're kind of limited or structured from most concrete to most abstract which is the mentality that you should be thinking about when you're refactoring your code. And the overall goal uh, for like lower level refactoring is that your code should be self-documenting. So when the next developer comes on board, um, you want to be able to speed up the time that it takes for them to be able to help. And also for your future self, you're probably not going to remember stuff from three months ago. Uh, I don't remember stuff from three days ago. So for me, I do this religiously. Now, a couple of topics that really didn't fit into my, my example, and, um, but that I've learned since then. Uh, a really easy win is the correct data type. One of my former students, I was reviewing one of his blog posts, and he was applying a regular expression to a string, and the end result of that is always, uh, what typically is an array. So when he was parsing the string that was his URL to his database, and later on in his code, when he had to set his port and set his configuration, he was referring to it as like port equals match three and password equals match five. You know, and it really didn't make sense when you were looking at it. So just by adding, you know, one extra line and converting that from an array into an object, so you could say port equals db.port and password is db.password, you can drastically increase the not only the maintainability, because then you know exactly, you only have to change it in one spot, but the readability and being able to understand what's going on drastically goes up. Uh, another really easy win is the style guide. Um, for those OCD on the Ruby style, it's been a while since I've coded in Ruby, so in hindsight, I probably am not following this rule myself. Uh, but there's a couple of style guides out there, um, especially for JavaScript, a lot of people just you know, I guess because it's so easy to get started with JavaScript, people just don't follow along with the style guides. And you can drastically increase readability with that. Uh, simple just white space can, can really uh, speed up understandability. Uh, another really easy win is linting. So nowadays we have tools like Gulp and Grunt, and we get this feedback sort of instantaneously. You know, we have to go in and check the terminal. Maybe your company is cash flow positive and you actually have a nice monitor. Um, jealous. So, um, but for the rest of us, you can actually integrate linting tools into your IDE. So for Ruby, there's RuboCop. I know that it integrates uh, into Sublime Text and ESLint and I believe JSHint uh, can integrate into Sublime Text as well. And that's really valuable. Um, when it's in your IDE, I know from Sublime text, like if I've set it up as a warning or an error, I'll get a little yellow dot 
or a little red dot, respectively, uh, right where I'm starting to mess up. Uh, so another just overall concept is the fat model skinny controller. I think this is kind of uh, well known in the Ruby community. Uh, I'm in, I do mostly Angular now, and it doesn't seem as prevalent there. Like they tell you only use controller as the glue, but uh, from many code bases I've seen people just put the uh, code inside the controller. But you really should be trying to put stuff into the model because that's kind of where it belongs. Models are for business logic. And if you're doing anything really complex in the controller, um, then it's probably business logic. Uh, also, models are reusable and controllers are not. So uh, this next one, private method crap files. Uh, so me personally, if you come into my apartment, it's like really clean, uh, mostly because my wife is much cleaner than me. But we both have this one closet that we just, I think it's human nature or it's just us. But it's, it would be like, if you open it up, it's a classic cartoon <laughs> of just all these boxes and crap falling on top of you. And I think it's kind of human nature. You know, we want things to be organized. But at some point, we're just like, screw it, just shove it under the bed or put it in this closet. And my suggestion is when you run into this, put, put that crap inside of private methods. So your public methods, when someone comes along, they should be able to read exactly what is going on, unless on how it's being done. So put all that how crap inside private methods. And lastly, the cadence. Uh, so how, how often should you be refactoring? You know, we kind of talked about how it's not worth it all the time. Um, the two strategies that I've found that work really well is the first, first strategy is when you are on GitHub and you make a pull request, there's a little option called files changed. So when you're making this pull request before you merge it in, actually like right when you push up and you're ready to merge it in, you know, look at the code, put on this hat of you in three months. Are you gonna know what this other variable is? Maybe go down this list, see if uh, there's anything that you can fix. And then that, that will help you get like the nitty gritty, maybe like five lines at a time or like one, one line, one variable. So you'll be able to clean up the nitty gritty um, portions of that. The second strategy I found that works really well is, um, let's say I just got done feature A, and now I'm working on feature B. And as, I, as I'm working through my feature B, I notice there's stuff in feature A that I should have cleaned up. You know, I should have reorganized this or have this sort of structure. Um, so what I do is I have a file that's just a running list uh, in descending order of importance of things that I'm gonna clean up. And one day a month, um, sometimes two days a month, I'll go through that list and I'll just knock everything out. So that's really good at picking up less like the nitty gritty um, and more of the general architecture and structuring of your app. So fast forward to today, um, over the last two and a half years, I've had four, I guess, major paradigm shifts, personally. Uh, the first one is not to see code as a project. So project by definition, it means temporary in nature. Uh, and all the code that I've worked on in the past, you know, we always throw out this term of project. And a living object, rather, means that you're going to invest time and it's gonna grow. And that's kind of a requirement with code. You know, it's just like if you have a dog, it's worth the time to train it so that you get the uh, rewards of having a well-trained dog over time. Uh, another paradigm that I've adopted from the UX community, uh, UX lives by this phrase of don't make me think. So you don't want your users to think. If your app is complicated, you know, it might be simple to you. It's always seemed simple to you. But if it's complicated from a UX perspective, people are gonna find another option um, wherever there is one. And that kind of leads into the third paradigm. Uh, in the development community, we've, we always think that it's the next developer's job to understand what's going on. Like every Stack Overflow, it'll just be like a bunch of barely legible code and we're like, oh, it'll be up to the person that asked the question to understand what's going on. And I've adopted a different mentality, and I believe it's my job to make sure that the next developer, which most likely will be me, uh, make sure that that next person 
can understand easily what my code's doing. And lastly, uh, you know, we call ourselves software engineer. You know, it's kind of uh, a lot of us distinguish between developer and software engineer. Um, and I, I think a lot of what we do is much more like writing. We're trying to tell a story in our code. I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, you know, you're trying, if you have server-side code, you're trying to explain to the next developer, okay, when you hit this endpoint, you're gonna go to this controller, these steps are gonna happen inside this model, and then you're gonna return this object. So you're trying to tell that story. You're not really doing complex calculations. Maybe if you're, um, you know, your single job is performance at a big company, um, then that's more engineering. But instead, we should see ourselves as writers who are trying to tell a story that the next developer, who's most likely going to be you, needs to understand. So with that, I'm going to get a couple of shameless plugs. Uh, Florence Healthcare, we're always looking for smart people. And the nonprofit that started, um, we're looking for people who like sweet electronics and donating to charity. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, so the, the comments, um, actually, when I, when I was in school, I had one computer science course, and it was like really entry level. And the professor was OCD about comments, even though the stuff we were doing was like print from a for loop, and really, sadly, basic stuff. Uh, and so when I applied for this job that I was, just got done talking about, I had comments everywhere. And they, they actually saw that as a negative. So they, they were like, please don't put this many comments in your code. So the general rule that I go for is it's OK to explain why. That's the whole point of comments is explaining why. Um, when you want to explain what, then that's where you just really need to get awesome at naming your methods and your variables. And if you have a really complex how um, question, then that's also okay for comment. So, if you have that opportunity, that's awesome. Uh, in this case, the project that I was working on, it didn't have any tests. Um, it's kind of a requirement, I would say. Um, that being said, if you're doing a lot of like UI, you know, front end testing, um, sometimes your testing is a manual test. So uh, I think in a perfect world, there'd always be tests before you refactor. You really, if you're doing server side, I strongly recommend it. So. Um, yes. what, how do you Uh, so I usually handle the like little stuff. Um, so that was like the one strategy I was talking about where you do it when you make a pull request. So if you work at a company where you have like a peer who can do it for you, like do your code review right there, um, that's really helpful. Um, and then, you know, just one day a month, just have it where, you know, you make those big architectural changes. Does that answer your question? Uh, so I like where I am in the process. We definitely try to do the whole course of stuff. Yeah, if there's something that the team is not in there, then they're going to try to do the job that kind of has like process and no security. But then sometimes you find that um, you need to work on some piece of code that's just a terrible, terrible behavior. Like, you know, before we try to do the work, we just need to, you know, be factored in the higher side. You know, how do you? Um, so in general, I guess to answer that, what, what I try to do is I always try to make sure, you know, a general um, concept with refactoring is that you should make the changes so that the changes are easy. So re refactor the code, do what's necessary, um, you know, especially if you're not on like a super tight deadline. Do what's necessary to make it so that the changes can be done 
really easily. So, you know, like with those magic numbers, uh, if we have like set timeout to do something every half second, you might have this number 500, 500 milliseconds in five different spots. But if you can write the code so that, um, you know, you replace those with a bunch of variables um, and then you can change it very easily, then that's the general strategy. So um, I think that would kind of figure out the incremental and the major. Um, if it's kind of like not really relevant to what you're doing, uh, a lot of people like to use git, git blame, which will track the commits. And if you're putting in um, like the GitHub ticket or the Jira ticket number. So I usually don't try to just change that because then people will look back and be like, oh, this has nothing to do with feature C. Why, why is this ticket associated with it? So I usually don't do that. Um, I'll actually make a ticket for like refactor or like general refactor. So um, it'll clean up the git blame and it's easier to follow that way. Um, how to identify technical debt. Um, if you're saying WTF, <laughs> uh, that's, that's a really, I mean, that's, I think that's like a really obvious indicator. If you're physical body language, you're going like, what is this? I mean, that's another pretty obvious sign. Um, there's a bunch of tools out there that will kind of do it electronically, like Code Climate is a good one. Um, and I know there's a couple of other options. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's a great sign. Uh, another thing is like, yeah, yeah. Another sign is like when someone asks you to update something, and just based on your reaction, like, is if your response is if it wasn't made for that, or you're like you can't immediately think of where you need to go or the next five steps that you need to do. That's a sign of technical debt as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Thanks for coming.